Well, I don't know if this is a sign that I'm just getting old, but this is the third Sunday in a row where I was walking up the stairs, and it's kind of dark as we're changing out the band and pulling the pulpit over, that I thought to myself, don't trip and fall on these stairs. And I don't know why. This is the third Sunday in a row. I've gone 13 years, and I don't think I've ever thought that walking up the stairs. And now for three Sundays in a row, I thought, don't embarrass yourself and trip in the dark up these stairs. So I guess I must be getting old. But nonetheless, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. We're going to look at somebody who was getting old, Isaac. And uh, he is about to do something uh, in this chapter that uh, is probably familiar to some people and maybe not so familiar to other people. Uh, But this is one of the saddest chapters in the Bible. It, It is a story of dysfunction at every level. You have four main characters, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, and Esau, and not a one of them acts with integrity or in accordance with the Word of God. It is a sad, sad story. And we're going to see the pain and the anguish that each of them faces as they walk, not in accordance to the truth, but in accordance to their own wishes, ways, and dysfunction. Uh, I've entitled the message this morning, How to Foster Dysfunction in Your Relationships. Obviously, that is not what we want to do, right? It's, it's four ways that we end up doing that that we should not do. So just in case uh, you're not clear as we go through the notes and you're thinking, why would the pastor be telling us to foster dysfunction in our relationships? I'm telling you these are ways that we end up fostering dysfunction that we should not be doing, all right? So just so we're clear to get going. Somebody in the lobby earlier told me, said, uh, I have an exchange student with me this morning, and they don't speak good English, and they were having a really t- hard time figuring out why we would want to be doing these things. So I just wanted to make that clear this morning. These are not things we want to do, but we've all been in dysfunctional relationships, haven't we? And whether we're the dysfunctional party, or the other person is the dysfunctional party, or whether the whole group of us together is a dysfunctional party, we've all been in relationships that are not functioning uh, with integrity, and with honesty, and with clarity, and with love, and with charity, and with grace, and with forgiveness. And we all do that, because we're all sinners. We all bring sin to the relationship, whether it's a dating relationship, whether it's a marriage relationship, whether it's a relationship between a, a parent and a child, whether it's a work relationship, a school relationship a teacher and a student, we all bring some measure of dysfunction to that because we all bring our own baggage and sin into that relationship. But there's things that we can do to to move away from that, and there's things that we do that end up fostering that and making it become worse. And what we're going to see this morning is that in this relationship of this family, they are all adding to the problem. And we want to avoid those things. But here's the good news. And this is the main point that I want us to walk away with. The overarching idea. Because we're going to see a lot of problems. And it's easy to think, man, what a a mess this is. And it is a mess. But here's the overarching main point. God functions just fine even in our dysfunction. God functions just fine even in our dysfunction. He is not swayed by our sin. He is not moved out of his will by our inability. He is not thwarted in his plan by our mess-ups. He is sovereign and he functions just fine no matter what incapable things or inexcusable things we do here. And we're going to see that as clearly as the book of Genesis plays out, but specifically here in chapter 27. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to chapter 27. Let's stand as we honor the reading of the Word. This is a long story, but I think it's an important story. And I'm going to read the whole story because we don't want to miss any of it. And if you'll take some time just to put yourself for a minute in the position of each of these characters, right? So as we begin, we're going to be looking at Isaac, and then we're going to be looking at Rebecca, and then we're going to be looking at Jacob, and then we're going to be looking at Esau. And I want you to just be thinking as I read this, how each of these people must have felt as this story is unfolding. Let's look at verse 1. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, He called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And prepare for me delicious food, such as I love. 
and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare from them a delicious food for your father such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and, and I shall be seen to mock him, or be mocking him, and bring a curse upon myself, and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice, and go bring them to me. So he went and took them, and brought them to his mother. And his mother prepared delicious food, such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hands of her son Jacob. So he went in to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you've told me. Now sit up and eat my, of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, are you really my son Esau? And he answered, I am. Then he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate it. And he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, see, the smell of my son is the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your brother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, Who are you? He answered, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came, and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me two times. He took away my birthright and behold, now he's taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him Lord over you, and all his brothers I have given to him for servants, and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be. And away from the dew of the heaven on our high, by your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother. And when, you're, when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, 
The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother, in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be reft of both of, of both of them one day? Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite woman. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? Father, we thank you for your word. Father, this is a long narrative, but oh, there's some richness that we need to dwell on, that we need to meditate on, that we need to think about in the dysfunction of this family. And Father, I pray for our families. I pray for our church family. I pray for our individual families. I pray for relationships in our workplaces with friends, with coworkers, with neighbors. That Father, we would not foster the attributes that are displayed here so that we might have relationships that bring honor and glory to Jesus. That we might have relationships that are full of kindness and love and affection. That we might have relationships that are full of truth and justice and rightness and faithfulness. Father, I pray today that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable unto you. For you are my rock and my redeemer. I pray this in the matchless and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So with the overarching theme of the idea that God functions just fine in our dysfunction, let's look at four ways that we can operate dysfunctionally that will not help us thrive in our lives. And the first one is that uh, we will walk according to our feelings instead of the Word of God. If you want to breed dysfunction in your relationships, just do what feels right. Don't listen to the Word of God. Don't walk in His truth. Just react as a feeling or an impulse comes to you. We see this here with Isaac. Now let's look at that. Verse 1, when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son. Here, he answered, here I am. He said, I do not know the days of my death. Now take your weapons, your quiver, your bow, go out to the field and hunt game for me and prepare for me delicious food such as I love and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. So here Isaac is calling forth. He's about to die. In reality, he's got several more years left. We'll learn that later. But he's getting older. And he's thinking, you know what? I'm not going to be here forever. I need to pass on the blessing. Now, here is the problem. He doesn't call the son that God told him to call. He calls the other son. He liked Esau better than Jacob. We saw that last week in chapter 26. It said that Esau loved Esau. Uh, uh, excuse me, Isaac loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, we need to put the context of this back from chapter 25. When Rebekah was barren and Isaac was praying that God would give him children, and it says there in verse 21, he says he prayed for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife conceived, and the children struggled together within her. And she said, if this is, is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And here's what the Lord said. This is what the Lord told uh, Rebekah and Isaac. He said, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Jacob is the one that's going to be blessed. Jacob is the one in which the promise is going to be carried through. Jacob is the one that ha should, should have the, the attention of Isaac. And yet, what, who does Isaac call when he's getting older? He calls the one that he likes. You see, we do that from time to time, don't we? We, we do what we want to do, no matter what God has said. God has said we should operate this way, but we operate this way. 
God has said we should not have sex until we get married, but we feel like having sex, so we do it anyway. God says we should be faithful to our wife, but we feel like not being faithful to our wife, so we do it. don't do it. God says we shouldn't steal from our company, but we have a little bit of extra that we need on the side, so we do steal from our company. See, we we're operate out of our feelings and our emotions and our greed and our desires instead of operating out of the will of God. Isaac knew who he was supposed to bless and he didn't want to do it, so he just did what he wanted to do. And when we operate in relationships not according to the word and will of God, but according to how we think and feel in our own flesh, it just breeds more dysfunction in our lives. This is exactly what Isaac does. He says, I bring, I bring uh, Esau to me. Now this blessing, this last part here in verse 4, it says that my soul may bless you before I die. This is a big deal. The blessing is a big deal. It's even more significant than the inheritance which we saw him steal, which we saw Jacob steal earlier from Esau. Because the blessing is a continuation of the blessing of God that was given to Abraham. In in chapter 12, Abraham receives the blessing from God. It says in verse 2, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so this blessing is going to be passed down from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph. And so Isaac, not listening to God, is a big deal. He decides, I'm going to bless who I want to bless who I like, who does the right thing for me. I like the food that, uh, that Esau brings me. I like the man that Esau is because he's out in the wild, a man's man. And Jacob, he's a tent dweller. He's a city boy, not my kind of guy. If I'm going to have my family name passed down, I want it passed down through my guy, through the guy I want. So he completely ignores what God has said. He's walking according to his feelings instead of the word of God. It's a guaranteed way to bring dysfunction into your life and relationships. A- another way to bring dysfunction into your life and relationships is to scheme and manipulate instead of trusting God to accomplish his plan. Scheme and manipulate. We've all done this at times, right? We've thought, you know what? I've got to have a different plan. I've got a better plan. God doesn't seem to be working out his plan, so I'll have my own plan. We saw this from Abraham and Sarah. We saw this from Isaac and Rebecca. And we see it continue in this family. That instead of trusting that God's going to do what he's going to do, he's going to, we're going to have to have a different plan. See, Rebecca knew. Rebecca's the one who carried Esau and Jacob in her womb. Rebecca's the one who heard directly from God that the younger will be greater than the older. And yet, when things start to shake out, and she hears uh, Isaac begin to try to call uh, uh, Esau for the blessing, what does she do? Oh, we can't have that. I'm going to have to step in. I know God said that he, the younger would serve the older, but it looks like, it feels like, it seems like, that's not going to be the way it is. Isaac's going to do something. I've got to thwart the plan. I've got to circumvent the, the situation. So she begins to scheme and manipulate. Look at verse 5. Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother. I heard it. I I know what the plan is. So she says, bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may bring it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice as I've commanded you. If you're not interested in having Jacob obey God's voice, just obey my voice. I've got a better plan than God. Don't listen to God. Listen to me. I've got a plan that's more important. I've got a plan that will get us to the same place, but it'll be a lot easier. We can trust it. We can, we can be in control of it. So she says to him, go to the flock and bring me two young goats. So that I may prepare for them delicious food for your father such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I'm a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me and he shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. See, Jacob is a little nervous about this plan. 
He's worried that instead of getting a blessing, he's going to get a curse. It's fair. Nobody likes to be deceived. Nobody likes to be tricked. And he's worried that if he goes in and his father discovers, hey, he's not really Esau, that not only will he not be blessed, he'll actually be cursed. But don't worry, Rebecca. Got a plan. She's got a, a system in place. She's got a opportunity ahead of her. So his mother said to him, verse 13, let your curse be on me, my son. Obey, only obey my voice and go bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother and his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goat she put on his hands, and the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. You see, some of us know the Word of God, and some of us want to do the will of God, but some of us refuse to do it the way of God. Think about that for a minute. A lot of us know what God's Word says. And if you ask us, do you want to do the will of God? Most of us would say, yeah, I'd like to see the will of God accomplished. But when it comes down to it, we refuse to do it the way of God. We, we think that we don't need God. We can accomplish all that we're supposed to accomplish in our own flesh, but we can't. See, we don't need to help God out. We just need to do what God says. God doesn't need our help to accomplish his will and his plan. God, God is sovereign over all things. God is all powerful. He doesn't need you to come up with a new plan. He doesn't need you to come up with a different way. He just simply needs us to walk in obedience to him, to know his word, to walk in his will, and to do it his way. And Rebecca wasn't willing to do that. She was scheming and manipulating instead of trusting in God. The third way is that we use deception or misdirection instead of walking in the truth and with forthrightness. We don't operate in integrity. If you want to have dysfunction in a relationship, don't operate with integrity. Operate where nobody can trust you, where what you say you don't exactly do, where everything is gray and nothing is black and white, where there's always an escape to whatever you've said or whatever you've done. Well, what about this? Or I wouldn't have done that if it weren't for this. Or you don't understand the situation fully. And we always leave ourselves a little bit of wiggle room so we can get out of whatever it is that we've put ourselves in. We use deception or misdirection or, hey, it's not, this is not the issue. Look over here. That's the issue. And we see that again here. Look at verse 18. So he went to his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, listen to this, first of three lies. N not just, hey, I'm going to dance around it, I'm going I'm to shade it a little bit. Three direct lies. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Lie number one. I have done as you've told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you found it so quickly, my son, and he answered with lie number two. Because the Lord your God granted me success. Now, it's one thing to lie. It's another thing altogether to lie and to bring the name of God into it. I mean, that's exactly what Jacob does here, isn't it? Your God granted me great success. I was out hunting, and he was the one who brought the animals. And man, it, God just provided for me. I mean, goodness. The lie just keeps growing, which is how lies are, right? We tell one lie, we got to tell a bigger lie to get out of the first lie, especially if we get questioned about it. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come near me that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Now, I can't imagine all that uh, Jacob's feeling here, but probably if you're like me, you've been in this spot. I mean, I remember being a kid at times, and I wasn't being truthful with my parents, and they, they started to figure out what was going on. And right, I'd tell one story and, and they'd say, well, what about this? And then you'd tell another lie. And they'd say, well, what about that? And then your heart starts beating faster, right? You been there? Your heart starts pat pattering, thinking, I'm going to get caught. I'm going to get caught. I'm going to get caught. 
It's going to be bad. And that's exactly how you know, Jacob's feeling. So Jacob went near to his father and felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, are you really my son Esau? Lie number three. He answered, I am. Well, he was not. He was not. Every time I read uh, this story, I, I often, uh, my attention is often drawn to a, a counter story, a, a story in which we see a different response and a different reaction upon uh, the conclusion. See, numbers are big in the Bible, and we see here that Jacob lies to his father three times. And my mind always flashes forward to Peter in the courtyard when he was being asked, aren't, aren't you a follower of Jesus no, I am not. Wait, di didn't we see you hanging out with him? You, you speak with a Galilean accent. No, don't you know him? No, I, I don't know him. I don't follow him. And again, don't, don't you walk with Jesus? Aren't you one of his disciples? No. And then the cock crowed. And you see a different reaction from Peter than we do from Jacob. What was Peter's reaction? And he went out and wept bitterly. And what's Jacob's reaction? Carry on. Mission accomplished. Got what I came for. Blessing secured. Moving right along. I don't know about you, but when I mess up, like Jacob, like Peter, I pray my response is like Peter's that I have a conviction of my sin, that I repent, that I weep over it. We just don't see that here from Jacob. Now, Jacob is a faithful man. Jacob's going to come around. God's not done with Jacob. This is not the end of the story. We see Jacob listed in the hall of faith, Hebrews. God's going to do tremendous things through Jacob, but in this moment, Jacob is at the bottom. Here's the good news. Maybe you're just coming out of making decisions like Jacob. And you feel like you're at the bottom. You feel like God can never forgive me. I, I, haven't, I don't even feel a spirit of repentance in my soul. Well, I want you to know this morning, God's not done writing your story. If you will turn to Him, if you will repent of your sin, you will confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God's not done with you. So Jacob carries on. He says, I am. Then he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate. And he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac asked, uh, said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And we see the blessing in, chapter, in verse 28. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. And what is the blessing? The first part of the blessing is may God provide for all of your needs. God will take care of you, Jacob. You have nothing to worry about. You're thirsty, you'll have water. You're hungry, you'll have food. You're in need, God will meet you there. And then verse 29, second part of the blessing. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Second part of the blessing is that you will be a great in the land. Not only will you have your needs taken care of, you will be powerful and people will serve you and people will honor you. And then the third Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. When people respond negatively to you, that will be a negative on them. And when people respond positively to you, that will be a positive on them. Jacob, your life is going to have something, buddy. You're going to do great things and be great amongst the people. Which, ironically, is exactly what God promised Rebekah when the, babe, when the two were still in her womb, that the older would serve the younger. 
So the blessing that Isaac ends up giving Jacob is the blessing that God promised that Jacob would receive before he was even born. Even though Isaac doesn't realize that he's blessing the right kid, he thinks he's blessing the other kid. God functions, God functions just fine even in our dysfunction. The fourth way to pursue dysfunction in your relationship that we ought to avoid is to pursue revenge instead of grace. I can't tell you how many times I've been counseling with a couple or a family or a person and so much of the issue goes back to their unwillingness to forgive a wrong that had been committed against them years ago. They will not let go of the grudge. They will not forgive. They will not show any mercy and grace. It's always about revenge. It's always about I'll get them back. It's always about I hope horrible things happen to them for what they did to me. They cannot move on from the past experience because they have built up so much bitterness and anger towards someone that that is now ruining their own life. And that's what bitterness and holding grudges do. It doesn't affect, uh, impact the person that has wronged us. It destroys us. And we see that anger welling up in, Isaac's, uh, excuse me, in Esau's life. And as we read this, let me just be honest. It is so easy for me to side with Esau here. It is so easy in my flesh to think I would feel the same way. I would hate my brother if he did that to me. Not just once, but twice. And that's exactly what we see in Esau's life. Look at verse 30. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. The, the, Moses here is giving us this indication that this was a near miss. That Jacob has barely left the room before Isaac shows up. We don't know if this is minutes or hours or days, but it's a near miss. uh, Esau had also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And his father uh, said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, who are you? He answered, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. Look at Isaac's response. It's in this very moment between verse 32 and verse 33 that Isaac realized that he's been duped. But he had started off to be a good thing. I'm going to bless my son. has now turned into something horrible. And if you have multiple kids, you know there's No worse feeling than realizing that something has gone awry between the two of them. And that you're in the middle of it. His father Isaac said to him, who are you? He answered, I'm your son, firstborn son Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came. And I have blessed him. Yes, He is the one to be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, oh, we've all been there, haven't we? He cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, He is... Is he not rightly named Jacob? Remember the name Jacob means heel catcher or the deceiving one, the deceiver. For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright. He took away my inheritance. And behold, now he has taken away my blessing. The birthright was the inheritance of the property and the stuff, but the blessing was even more important. The blessing was the hand of God, the providence of God, the work of God, the name of the family of which Abraham had passed to Isaac, which would be passed to either Esau or Jacob, and God chose Jacob. 
And he says, oh, but have you not reserved something for me? Have you reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said to Esau, behold, I have made him Lord over you. Can you think about a worse thing to hear as a brother? Especially as an older sibling. Like I'm the oldest in my family and the, the thought that my sister would be the boss over me would just drive me through the roof. Any oldest siblings in here relate to that? And I love my sister, but ain't no way she's going to be the boss over me. I have made him Lord over you. And remember, Isaac's a man's man. He's like, that sissy boy that lives in the tent is going to be my boss? I have given to him for servants, and, I with, and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Basically saying, is I gave him everything. There's no blessing left. He has all of the protections of God, all of the resources of God, all of the, the, the power of God. He has all of these things, and there's nothing left for you. And Esau said to his father, <laughs> Look, this is the third time. Please, is there not anything? Have you but one blessing? Can, can you just give me something else? Bless me, even me also, oh my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth, shall your dwellings be. It's the opposite. He, he gets the opposite of what Jacob gets. Remember, Jacob got all of the fatness and the dew of the earth to him. And what does Esau get? The opposite. Away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be. Away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. And when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. And then we get to verse 41, in which I can't imagine any of us not being able to relate to these emotions. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. Revenge. I will get revenge. Because if I kill my brother Jacob, guess what I get? I get my birthright back, and I get my blessing back. I'm going to have a plan to get rid of him, just like he had a plan to get rid of me. I will show revenge. But the word of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. Rebekah is just a gossip, man. She hears everything. She knows, she's the lady in the church that knows everything that's going on. She knows what you bought at the grocery store, where you went on your honeymoon. She knows it all. And you're trying to figure out, how does this lady know everything? But this is Rebecca. She knows it all. And so she called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Have you ever been in that situation where just thinking about revenge, just thinking about getting somebody back, is like some kind of solace or comfort to your own soul. That, that's the definition of dysfunction. That's the definition of a, a, a root of bitterness. That instead of thinking about grace, instead of thinking about forgiveness, instead of thinking about how to bring restoration to a relationship that you've been wronged in, all you can think about is getting somebody back. And somehow getting somebody back makes you just a little bit better, makes you feel just a little bit better. And that's where we find Esau. And so Re Rebecca says to her son in verse 43, Obey my voice, arise, flee to Laban, my brother in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you and he forgets what you've done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Now here's the, here's the thing. When Rebecca sends Jacob out, her favorite son, she will never see him again. He will, 
she will die before he comes back. She says, go away to be safe so that then you can come back. But by the time he can come back, she's no longer there. That's dysfunction. Instead of finding a way to make the relationship right while you can, you run from it, you hide from it, you ignore it, you pretend it'll get fixed later. Instead of just dealing with it. Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to him? And see, in the end, it's back to Rebekah. She does not want Jacob to do what Esau did because we saw at the end of chapter 26 that Esau married Hittite women. And it says there at the end of 26, when Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basemith, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. It's amazing that when you actually start to trace back dysfunction, it always comes back to sin. This whole story in chapter 27 is set up by the last verse of chapter 26. That Esau did not obey God. He married outside of the people of God. And it caused great bitterness amongst his parents. And that bitterness amongst his parents then flowed out to bitterness amongst their children. Disobedience leads to disobedience, which leads to disobedience. Now here's the good news. God fulfilled his word despite Isaac's opposition, despite Rebekah and Jacob's manipulation, and despite Esau's indifference. The invincible determination of God will see to it that his people are sanctified. See, God does not operate in dysfunction, but in order and in sovereignty. And no matter what's going on in our lives, and in the relationships around us, God is faithful to accomplish his will and his plan. Our job is to respond with faithfulness and obedience. 